So you mentioned uh, salvage therapy in regards to you know relapse. Is that all of the treatments that you mentioned, or are there other treatments that patients can do in this situation? Well, the salvage situation, you kind of have to ask yourself, are we trying to uh, control the disease, or are we trying to cure the disease? And one would say, well, of course, you always want to try and cure the disease. But when you are going for a cure, as I mentioned before, you're, you're uh, using an accumulation of treatments, and that incurs greater side effects. So if someone is somewhat more elderly and they appear to have minimal metastatic disease, you might want to just simply radiate the spot because it has almost no side effects if done skillfully and see how it goes. Uh, if that doesn't work, uh, maybe give a little bit of Cassidex and just keep the disease in check for for many, many years using that methodology. Then on the other hand, if a person is younger, uh, the desire for cure um, is much greater uh, as uh, quality of life will be better and possibly uh, people would have better survival too. So people will invest more in doing more aggressive therapy, systemic therapy as I outlined with hormones, mild chemo and radiation in combination to get the best chance for a cure and then even if those patients aren't cured, they certainly go into more durable remissions and get longer holiday periods and continue to push the disease problem further into the future. And of course, we're all hoping for new and better discoveries as the future approaches. So, um, so that is, I think, the, uh, the real question is, in any specific individual, depending on how aggressive the cancer is, where it's located, and how old they are, uh, are we trying to just control it? the situation, which is often a very controllable situation, or are we trying to go for a cure? So you mentioned, you know, the fact that many of these patients are on different combinations of treatments. So in the hierarchy of side effects, what would you say is the, the number one side effect that you watch out for, and is there a way that you mitigate that? In the old days, it used to be radiation because the uh, side effects would be uh, permanent, uh, and we would ar argue that the hormone therapy side effects are reversible. Uh, chemotherapy side effects are reversible. But modern radiation has become so sophisticated that I'm not seeing much of any permanent side effects, except, of course, in the men that are getting their prostates radiated, where they de radiated, where they uh, develop problems with erectile dysfunction. But radiating lymph nodes and these sorts of things, if it's done skillfully, is quite safe. So now we're just dealing with the, the long-term effects of uh, low testosterone, where men feel weak and tired, um, lose their sex drive, develop hot flashes, gain weight, and uh, all those things present challenges. They're manageable challenges, but they're not insignificant. Taxotere chemotherapy, the most popular type of chemotherapy that is sometimes used in relapse patients, is um, a pretty tolerable treatment. You can have some uh, reversible hair loss, transient cyclical tiredness with each in, uh, injection. Uh, but if it's, it's uh, as chemotherapies go, it's, I would uh, describe it as a mild chemotherapy. People tend to, again, group chemo into this one big grab bag, but people that get leukemia and breast cancer and lung cancer, all these types of cancers are treated with uh, types of chemotherapy that are probably two or three times more intensive than what's administered to a prostate cancer patient. So um, it uh, requires a little bit of clarity as to when you say the word chemotherapy, what are we really talking about? And with prostate cancer, it's usually just a single, relatively uh, mild doses of a medicine called taxotere. The side effects of hormone therapy can be quite intimidating for a lot of patients. And I've even had conversations where patients have relapsed and their doctor has said, let's put you on some hormone therapy, and they're wondering if they can delay it. Does that pose a significant risk? Well, delaying hormone therapy was probably a mainstream uh, methodology is called intermittent hormone therapy for the last 20, 25 years. So it has been demonstrated that people can take holidays, allow the PSA to rise up to 5 or 10, restart hormone therapy, and that they won't be any worse off for having done so. And of course, they'll maybe better off because they can enjoy a time of having their testosterone back. I think what's changed uh, the uh, attitude now are the new PSMA PET scans because we didn't have the capacity to go find where the spot was located and now with uh, modern radiation treat it with practically no side effects. So, so a lot of the men that were being managed with intermittent hormone therapy and we were just temporizing, giving the therapy for six to 12 months, getting the PSA down, taking a holiday, allowing the PSA to rise up to you know three to five to six was our usual policy in our practice and then restarting the hormone therapy, PSA would go back down. That is um, 
certainly still feasible if uh, there are reasons to believe that you can't find the cancer and cure it. But in men that you can find the cancer and cure it with these new scans, that's certainly more attractive. And so we wouldn't just let the PSA float up. What we would do is uh, once the PSA becomes detectable, get a scan, find out where the cancer is, radiate it, possibly give some hormones or a short course of chemotherapy to try and get rid of any in small micromets, and uh, hope for a chance to either cure it or at least get a very long remission. Since PSMA has been kind of more approved and it's more widespread across the country, we've had many patients going, should I get a PSMA scan like every year, no matter what my PSA is? So how do you answer that? There are situations where we're ordering PSMA PET scans in people with undetectable PSAs who have, you know, been on hormone therapy a long time, for example. And uh, there's some nice videos by Eugene Kwan. He deals with a segment of prostate cancer patients who have very advanced, uh, aggressive cancers. And he's seen how certain individuals can have low PSAs and still uh, manifest growing cancers uh, detectable by scans. So, so there is a role for doing scans in people with undetectable PSAs. But most of the men that we're talking about who have undetectable PSAs, maybe have been through surgery or radiation and are probably cured, um, there's really no reason for us to be suspecting um, you know, uh, hormone resistance, small cell cancers that lurking in these patients. And so we're not routinely doing PSMA PET scans in people with undetectable PSAs. So there are exceptional subgroups that we would do a PSMA PET scan in those individuals. But on the other hand, uh, with relapse disease, uh, with PSAs start to rise, even as low as 0.2, um, uh, we are uh, very quick on the draw to get a PSMA PET scan. And in men that are um, being treated actively who have detectable PSAs and we're trying to find out if the treatment is working or not, we, we order lots of PSMA PET scans. As things stand right now, Medicare is, is covering them just like they've covered bone scans and CAT scans in the past. And, and I don't really see much role for old-fashioned bone scans and CAT scans any longer. I think now we're just relying exclusively on PSMA PET scans. They're far more accurate. So one of the questions that surrounds PSMA, you know, with MRIs, we talk about going to a quality center and we talk about getting a second reading if there's something um, disruptive on that report. So does that stand for PSMA as well? I don't think the skill uh, required for reading a PSMA PET scan anywhere approaches the skill required for reading an MRI of the prostate. PET scans in general have been around for a long time and uh, they didn't have PSMA, but they had FGG PET, they had Axomum PET. And so uh, the doctors that read these are generally familiar with reading PET scans. And uh, it's f certainly more straightforward than in reading a, a multiparametric MRI. There are a few wrinkles with PSMA that doctors do need to be aware of. And there's always a possibility that someone's reading a scan that doesn't, hasn't really been trained in doing it. So if, uh, if there is information coming through or conveyed by the scan that doesn't seem to add up, it's good to get a second opinion in those cases. But I don't think we have the same uh, rigorous dig diligence that we exercise with prostate MRIs where we, we practically review all MRIs that come from an unknown facility. We discovered half the time, the, unfortunately, they're not trained in reading them properly. Thanks for watching. If you would like more information about prostate cancer, you can go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We come out with new prostate cancer videos every week. And go ahead and visit our website, pcri.org. We have tons of information on prostate cancer that will help you.